Katie, thank you for that terrific panel uh, participation and program. To those who are, were on the panel, that was outstanding. I had the honor of welcoming Senator Stabenow just a moment ago. She is between votes, but she wanted to come here uh, and say hello to each of you and to share a few thoughts on her really important work. She even said, depending on how votes are called, she would be open to your questions uh, uh, as well. So it is truly an honor. I'm Evan Jenkins. I have the honor of working for the U.S. Chamber as the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs. I get to work with incredible legislators like Senator Stabenow. I am here to welcome her and to say what an honor it is for, her to, for us to have her here because of the really important work that she does. As you all know, it's truly a mission that is personal to her. Each of us have family members who have battled with challenges of mental health, and she certainly is not alone. She has spent her entire career addressing this really important issue. She knows the hardships and the stresses that mental health challenges place on individuals and families. And as a result, she has dedicated so much of her life and her career of per, uh, public service pursuing ways in which to address this most challenging issue. She spent 16 years in the Michigan State Legislature where she chaired the, health, uh, the House Mental Health Committee and worked to strengthen Michigan's mental health code through the Children's Mental Health Act and the Family Support Subsidy Act. In 2000, she became the first woman elected to the United States Senate from the state of Michigan. And she brought her advocacy for mental health funding, support, and treatment here to Washington. In 2014, she authored and passed the Bipartisan Excellence in Mental Health and Addiction Treatment Act, a landmark bill to fund community behavioral health services the same way we fund physical health services. She authored the mental health parity provisions of the Affordable Care Act and spearheaded the expansion of certified community behavioral health clinics programs in 15 states and continues to fight for greater mental health resources and services in schools across America. She is widely respected for her ability to build bipartisan coalitions to pass meaningful common sense reforms. Katie, I was looking at the title of the program uh, earlier. It said opportunities. Senator Stabenow is someone who sees possibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the senior senator from the great state of Michigan, Debbie Stabenow. I think I want you to go with me everywhere and introduce me, you know, that, uh, <laughs> you know, I am so excited that this program is being done. I want to thank the U.S. Chamber for focusing on not only needs uh, as it relates to uh, mental health, but also what we are doing positively to create high quality services to connect to give opportunities for all of you to, to be able to connect for these, with these services in your businesses, your employees, and so on. I want to thank Chuck and the National uh, Council. Just, it's, it's been a wonderful partnership that we have had moving forward for um, a lot of years. So great to see Michael Garrett here uh, from Detroit, uh, CNS Healthcare, and, and everyone that's, that is speaking already, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for. Um, let me just start because Evan mentioned sort of my background, and, and I do have to say, I grew up in rural Michigan, northern Michigan, and um, my mom was director of nursing at a small hospital. My dad was in the car business from Michigan. Not a surprise that my dad was a car dealer. <laughs> I'll date myself. My dad, it, my dad and my grandpa had the Oldsmobile dealership, so we don't make those anymore. But, uh, but uh, anyway, um, but we we had an cha unexpected challenge with uh, my dad, who um, 
uh, was bipolar and began symptoms when I was probably in fifth grade, sixth grade. We didn't know that. There wasn't the term bipolar. There weren't, weren't um, uh, effective medicines like lithium. There weren't, you know, at that time there was no knowledge about chemical imbalance in the brain that can cause you to have highs and lows and what that meant. Even my mom, who was a nurse uh, and had access to what was available to be able to connect, was not, a, you know, there wasn't anything other than the hospital. That was it. You could go into the hospital. So you could go in, and then they put you on Thorazine, which had no relationship to what, what the problem was, but then you'd calm down and come home, and a few months later, it would start again. So uh, at some point, um, you know, when I was a student at Michigan State University, I heard a, a young psychiatrist come in and talk about this breakthrough called lithium and, and this uh, diagnosis called manic depression at the time. And it turned out he was describing my dad. And so we got dad the help he needed. He went back to work, successfully work, once he got what he needed in help and stabilizing medication, he went back to work. I saw what happened when you don't get care that you need and when you do and what happens to the family. And so that put me on a path, basically, of wanting to do everything that I could to help uh, others be able to get the support that they and their families need in terms of mental health. Mental health is health care, number one. It's, it's not some, some th little side thing over here. This is health care. It's health care above the neck. We should be treating health care above the neck the same as health care below the neck. And that is, for me, um, a, a long step of journeys from being on a local community mental health board to being in the legislature to being where I am uh, today, and that leads me to certified community behavioral health clinics. And so why have I focused so much? It's been, actually been 10 years of focus on this. Um, and I have to say, I have, my partner, Roy Blunt, who's no longer in the Senate, my colleague from Missouri, has been absolutely my partner every step of the way. Back years ago, uh, Roy and I, every, uh, every year, every session, author the re-up of funding for community health centers, FQHCs, Federally Qualified Community Health Centers. And what's beautiful and bipartisan, supported by everyone, federally qualified community health centers. And you have to show high quality standards at the clinic, and then you can get full funding for that for the clinic, for all the services under Medicaid, and fully get reimbursed for your staff. So it's a, it's a permanent way to do community clinics. And I said to Roy, why don't we do that for mental health? Why is mental health and addiction funded through grants that stop and start? Stop, start, stop, start. You know, when you think of somebody who walks into a clinic and they've finally decided they're gonna deal with their addiction, hardest thing in the world, okay, I." I'm going to do it. I'm going to get help. And they walk in, and they go, oh, I'm so sorry. Come back in six months. The grant ran out. Actually, true story. So we said, so Roy says, well, that's a good idea. Well, what would you do? I said, well, okay, let me, let me put something down here. And we, and we basically created the same format for behavioral health. High-quality standards. You meet the standards, and then your clinic is fully funded. Now, prior to that, Medicaid would fund someone, a patient, if they were seriously mentally ill. So you'd have to figure out how serious was the person, could you get help for that person. It was this very disjointed, which is going on across the country now. These are take all comers, in Michigan now, and we're just really getting started in the last year, third of the time you walk in the door, you are seen that day, which is very significant. And on average, it's 10 days, it, you know, total 10 days. Within 10 days, somebody is able to get help. And I know that the numbers, I know my friends in Missouri and all of the other um, Places I know that the numbers are even, you know, they've been doing it lo longer than the Michigan demonstration project, and the numbers are amazing. Um, so we're, we now have a model that is evidence-based, 
we, I'm sure you've talked about law enforcement. We're, we're, you know, when you look at the numbers, I mean, the de facto mental health system in our country has been, you go to jail or you sit in the emergency room. That's it. And so what we've seen, and this relates to why this is so cost effective and so important as well, in addition to people getting the help they need, they can go back to work, they can manage, their lives, they can, you know, just when someone has diabetes and they're on insulin, you you make sure that you have a balance, right, in your sugar, even though your sugar is out of whack, you, you take insulin and you go on with your life. That's what we need to do with mental health. In addition, get people able to manage it and then they can go on with their life. They can go back to work. They can run their business. They can work at the school, wherever it is. But we know now, as we are doing CCBHCs, that there's over 60% reduction in somebody going to jail, sitting in jail. Some of our biggest supporters in getting this completely funded now have been the sheriffs and the police chiefs because they know that what's happening and that people need help. They don't want to have somebody sitting in jail that needs help. And the others are, of course, our hospital administrators because of the emergency department. And we've seen, again, over a 60% reduction there, over 41% reduction in homeless shelters, uh, in, in people being on the street, and, and hospitalizations in general dramatically down now. So what we're finding with this, and I so appreciate um, your focusing on this, is when we have comprehensive quality services, people are getting the help that they need and we aren't paying for other services that, first of all, are just a holding pattern. They are not effectively helping that individual or their family. Over the years, we have done a number of things that are important, like mental health uh, first aid, where we teach uh, teachers how to identify uh, mental health issues, or police officers or others. But I've always said, but if they have nowhere to refer them, then it's not gonna work, right? We have this wonderful new suicide hotline, 988, really, really important, it's, in, it's incredibly important. But you have to have somewhere to refer people. And so this answers the question of comprehensive care in the community, which is why it is so important. I don't know how much all of you have sort of have talked about the process and all this, but I, I will say that actually, um, it's been, I think, let's see, 60 years, 60 years this year since President John F. Kennedy, 60 years this year since he passed the Community Medical Health Act to actually do what we did. It's been 60 years. When it was 50 years on the 50th anniversary, Senator Blunt and I went to the floor and introduced our bill and his speech on the Senate floor. 50 years after the vision of closing, at that time they called asylums, at that time, 1963, uh, of just housing people. And, and President Kennedy said, we need to serve people in the community, closer to home with quality services. So it only took 50 years, 60 years. Um, but what we have done is also show that it actually works. Eight state demonstration project added two more states, so 10 states being fully funded to do this. Then we added what I call startup grants across the country. We have 500 individual clinics now, funded through grants, that's not the final, but 500 across the country now, in, now in every state, where we're saying if you meet the criteria, we'll get you started, we'll, we'll give you a grant, and then fold you in. And then the gun safety legislation, came along and folks were saying we need to do things about mental health. What could we do on mental health? <laughs> and, and again, everybody starts making up stuff, you know. And Roy calls me and goes, okay, we gotta make sure everybody understands this is, you know, this is going on already, you know, in 10 states it works, we got the evidence, you know, it, it, and so on and so on. And so we reach out, because folks, if it's not in their state, we just weren't paying attention to it, really. And so we, reached out and said, look, look what we could do if we actually expanded this. So that's what is happening now. So we have 10 original states. 
they're in the process of picking the next 10, which will happen at the beginning of the year, and then the next 10, and the next 10, uh, and so on. So states need to apply, say this is how we're going to do it, these are the quality standards, this is what we want to do, but we are taking this until it is a nationwide transformation we, where we are funding behavioral health as health care, which it is, and working with the community, with the business community, with law enforcement, with our uh, uh, health care uh, community to make sure it is integrated and therefore cost effective when we are doing it. So I'm uh, thrilled that, again, that you are very, that you're focused on this. This is something that we hoped would work. I have to tell you that when we first did it, this was sort of the, well, this sounds like it would work. Why wouldn't this work? And then after we had uh, the first clinics operating, I think it was only a year, a year and a half, and I said, can we get some data? You know, it may be too early, but could you get some data to determine are fewer people going to jail or sitting in the emergency department? And I was blown away when they came back and said 63% reduction in jail. And, and, and went on to show the other numbers. And so then we knew, okay, we hoped it would be a successful model. But in fact, it was. And it is. So we just need to embrace it to make sure it's fully funded across the country. There's no doubt in my mind that this is cost effective from every angle, from the individual to the community, uh, to the economy. I mean, in every thing you can imagine. Let me stop and just say that JFK said when he signed the bill 60 years ago, you know, one true measure of a nation is its success in fulfilling the promise of a better life for each of its members. Let this be the measure of our nation. And that's what we're doing, and I hope you will fully engage with us to move it forward. Thank you. I don't know. I'm happy to take a call, couple of questions. I don't know if they're pulling me out for the vote and are we okay? Or I know you're wrapping up, so I don't know if anybody has a hand up or not, or I can't tell. So, all right. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. What a great keynote right there. And I just want to thank you, Senator Stabenow, again for the incredible work you and your wonderful staff have done to provide high, access to high quality mental health and substance use care across our nation. Also, especially for your work on CCBHCs. We really appreciate your leadership here. Hello, everyone. I'm Raina Taylor. I'm the Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. This affords me the, the wonderful job of going to tell the amazing stories you heard today to members of Congress, to the White House, and to policymakers across our nation, and pretty much anyone who will listen to me. So given that job, I really want you to take away from this presentation that the CCBHC model is a game changer. It is what is the future for high quality access to care across our nation. We want to thank all of our keynote speakers, Senator Debbie Stabenow and Dr. Anita Everett, for, and our incredible hosts here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and of course our panelists. We really want to make sure that you take home today that this is the, uh, the opportunity of the future for mental health and substance use care across our nation. I want to thank you again for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your day, and be well. <laughs>